Hi guys, this is App Unwrapper. I'm here with Death Trap Dungeon and I'm excited to give it a try. Enjoy! Despite its name, Fang was an ordinary small town in a northern province of Chiang Mai, situated on the banks of a river. It made a convenient stopover for river traders and passengers throughout most of the year. A few barges, rafts, and sometimes even a large sailboat could usually be found moored at Fang. But all that was long ago, before the creation of the Trial of Champions. Now, once a year, the river is crowned with boats as people arrive from hundreds of miles around, hoping to witness the breaking of an ancient tradition and see a victor in the trial of champions. On the 1st of May each year, warriors and heroes come to Fang to face the test of their lives. Survival is unlikely, yet many take the risk, for the prize is great. A purse of 10,000 gold pieces and the freedom of Chiang Mai forever. But to become champion is no easy task. Some years ago, a powerful baron of Fang called Sukhumvit decided to bring attention to his town by creating the ultimate contest. With the help of the townspeople, he constructed a labyrinth deep in the hillside behind Fang, from which there was only one exit. The labyrinth was filled with all kinds of deadly tricks and traps and loathsome monsters. Sukhumvit had designed it in meticulous detail, so that anybody hoping to face its challenge would have to use their wits as well as weapon skill. When he was finally satisfied that all was complete, he put his labyrinth to the test. He picked ten of his finest guards and fully armed, they marched into the labyrinth. They were never seen again. The tale of the ill-fated guards soon spread throughout the land and it was then that Sukhumvit announced the first trial of champions. Messengers and news sheets carried his challenge 10,000 gold pieces and freedom of Chiang Mai forever to any person surviving the perils of the labyrinth of Fang. The first year, 17 brave warriors attempted the walk, as it later became known. Not one reappeared. As the years passed and the trial of champions continued, it attracted more and more challenges and spectators. Fang prospered and would prepare itself months in advance for the spectacle it hosted each May. The town would be decorated, tents erected, dining halls built, musicians, dancers, fire eaters, illusionists, and every sort of entertainer hired, and entries registered from hopeful individuals intent on making the walk. The last week of April found the people of Fang and its visitors in wild celebration. Everybody sang, danced and laughed until the day broke on the 1st of May when the town thronged to the gates of the labyrinth to watch the first challenger of the year step forward to face the trial of champions. Having seen one of Sukhumvit's challenges nailed to a tree, you decide that this year you will attempt the walk. For the last five years, you have been attracted to it, not for the rewards, but for the simple fact that nobody has ever yet emerged victorious from the labyrinth. You intend to make this the year in which a champion is crowned. Gathering up a few belongings, you set off immediately. Two days walk takes you west to the coast where you enter the cursed port Black Sand. Wasting no time in that city of thieves, you buy your passage on a small boat sailing north to where the river Coke meets the sea. And from there you raft upriver for four days until finally you arrive in Fang. The trial begins in three days time and the town is in an almost hysterical mood of excitement. 
You register your entry with the officials and are given a violet scarf to tie around your arm, informing everyone of your status. For three days, you enjoy Fang's greatest hospitality and are treated like a demigod. During the long merriment, you almost forget your purpose in Fang. But the evening before the trial, the magnitude of the task ahead begins to dominate your thoughts. Later, you are taken to a special guest house and are shown your room. There is a splendid four-poster bed with satin sheets to help you rest, but there is little time left for sleep. Just before dawn, a trumpet call awakens you from vivid dreams of flaming pits and giant black spiders. Minutes later, there is a knock on your door and a man's voice rings out saying, Your challenge begins soon. Please be ready to leave in 10 minutes. You climb out of bed, walk over to the window and open the shutters. Already people are thronging the streets, moving quietly through the morning mist. Spectators, no doubt on their way to the labyrinth, hoping to find good vantage points from which to watch the competitors. Walking over to a wooden table on which your trusty sword and shield lie, you pick them up and cut the air with a mighty sweep, wondering which beasts your sword's sharp edge may soon have to meet. You open the door into the corridor and a small man greets you with a low bow as you emerge from your bedroom. Please follow me, he says. He turns to his left and walks quickly towards the stairs at the end of the corridor. Walking through a parting in the crowds, you see Baron Sukhumbit himself standing by the entrance waiting to greet the contender in the trial of champions. You count five others standing proudly in line, their violet scarves displayed for all to see. There are two bare-chested barbarians dressed in furs. They stand completely motionless, legs straight and slightly apart, arms thrust forward to rest on the hilts of their long, double-headed battle axes. A sleek elven woman with golden hair and feline green eyes is adjusting the cross belt of daggers wrapped around her leather tunic. Of the two remaining men, one is covered from head to foot in iron plate armor with a plumed helmet and a crested shield. The other is cloaked in black robes, only his dark eyes showing between the swarms of his black face scars. Long knives, a wire garrote and other silent death weapons hang from his belt. The five contenders acknowledge your arrival with almost imperceptible nods of the head, and you turn to face the exultant crowd for the last time. Suddenly, a hush falls over the crowd as Baron Sukhumbit steps forward, holding six bamboo sticks. You draw one from his outstretched hand, and you read the word, fifth. Then the trial begins. The night is first. He salutes the crowd before disappearing into the tunnel and is followed half an hour later by the elf. Next goes a barbarian and then the dark assassin. Next, it's your turn. But before embarking on your adventure, we must first determine your own strengths and weaknesses. You have in your possession a sword, a shield, and a backpack for carrying provisions for the trip. You have been preparing for your quest by training yourself in swordplay and exercising vigorously. To see how effective your preparations have been, dice will be rolled to determine your skill, stamina, and luck scores. Or, if you wish to begin your adventure immediately, you can choose between three ready-made adventurers. Hmm. Let's roll. First, 
will roll for your initial level of skill. This reflects your sword skill and fighting expertise and will be determined by rolling one die and adding six. Two. Next, we'll roll for your initial stamina, which represents your strength. So the higher your stamina score, the longer you will survive. This will be determined by rolling two dice and adding 12. Sorry about the noise outside. No. How many times can I re-roll? Oh my god. Seriously? Fine, let's just take this. Next, we'll roll for your initial luck. Which clearly I have Which not. represents how lucky an adventurer you are. Luck and magic are facts of life in the fantasy world you're about to explore. This is determined by rolling one die and adding six. No. All right. I don't know if you could just roll forever. You may also take a magical potion with you to aid you on your quest. Each bottle of potion contains two measures, so it can be used twice during an adventure. You can choose from a potion of skill that restores your skill points to their initial amount, a potion of strength that restores your stamina points to their initial amount, or a potion of fortune that not only restores your luck points to their initial amount, but will also increase your initial luck score by one each time it's used. Why would I need to do this? Am I planning to lose stat points? Um, I'm confused between strength and stamina being the same, but I, I don't know. Lastly, before you begin your quest, you are given enough provisions for 10 meals. When you eat a meal, your stamina score will increase by four points. But don't forget, your stamina can never exceed the initial amounts you've just set. You have a long way to go, so use your provisions wisely. During your adventure, you'll enter into combat a number of times, and the further you go, the tougher your opponents will be. Combat takes place over several rounds, and your attack strength is based on yours and your enemy's skill scores. For each round of battle, we'll roll two dice for you and two for your opponent, adding the results to your skill scores. These are your respective attack strengths. Whoever's attack strength is the highest wins that round of combat. If you both had the same attack strength in a round, then it will be a tie. In some battles, you can take an opportunity to escape. But beware. If you do run away, your opponent will automatically score one hit on you as you flee costing you two stamina points. So be sure you have enough. Such is the price of cowardice. You are playing using the new battle system where the battle takes place over three rounds. Your sheer battle-hardened nature will mean you'll always win the battle after the three rounds, but every round you lose will cost you two stamina points. So be careful. Losing all your stamina will still be fatal. 
at the start of each round. You'll have a short time to decide to fight or to build up your stamina by eating your provisions or taking a potion, if you have one. I'm confused because why is stamina and strength the same thing? Maybe I just don't play enough uh, Dungeons and Dragons type of games, but um, that part confuses me. So it seems like a lot of it is going to be dice rolls. Um, anyway, I guess let's learn about the original battle system. You are playing using the traditional battle system from the original Death Trap Dungeon book. At the start of each round, you'll have a short time to decide to fight or to build up your stamina by eating your provisions or taking a potion, if you have one. After each battle round, you'll be able to test your luck. By using luck in battles, you can either score a more serious wound on your opponent or minimize the effects of a wound scored on you. If you test your luck after you have just wounded your opponent, we'll roll two dice, and if the total is the same, or less than your current luck score, you will have been lucky, and will take an extra two points from your opponent's stamina. But if the roll is greater, then the damage to your opponent will be halved. If your opponent has just inflicted a two stamina wound on you, a lucky roll will halve that damage, but an unlucky roll will take an additional stamina point. One last thing. Testing your luck has a cost. Each time you test your luck, your luck score will be reduced mm. by one point. Great. I don't know. You are playing using the new battle system where the battle takes place over three rounds. Your sheer battle-hardened nature will mean you'll always win the battle after the three rounds, but every round you lose will cost you two stamina points. So be careful. Losing all your stamina will still be fatal. At the start of each round, you'll have a short time to decide to fight or to build up your stamina by eating your provisions or taking a potion, if you have one. All right, let's go with the new battle system. Now it is your turn to salute the crowd. Holding your violet scarf aloft, you take one final deep breath of cool, fresh air before turning to pass between the stone pillared gateway into circumvent's corridors of power to face unknown perils on the walk through the mighty Baron's Death Trap Dungeon. The clamour of the excited spectators gradually fades behind you as you venture deep into the gloom of the cavern. Large crystals hang from the tunnel roof at 20 metre intervals, radiating just enough soft light for you to see your way. As your eyes gradually become accustomed to the near darkness, you begin to see movement all around. Spiders and beetles crawling up and down the chiseled walls disappear quickly into cracks and crevices as they sense your approach. Rats and mice scurry along the floor ahead of you. Droplets of water drip into small pools with an eerie plopping sound which echoes down the tunnel. The air is cold, moist and dank. After walking slowly along the tunnel for about five minutes, 
you arrive at a stone table standing against the wall to your left. On it, there are six boxes, one of which has your name painted on its lid. The lid of the box lifts off easily. And inside you find two gold pieces and a note written on a small piece of parchment addressed to you. After placing the gold in your pocket, you read the message, which says, well done. At least you had the sense to stop and take advantage of the token aid given to you. Now I can advise you that you will need to find and use several items if you hope to pass triumphantly through my death trap dungeon. Signed, Sukhumvit. Memorizing the advice on the note, you tear it into tiny pieces and continue north along the tunnel, where you come to a junction. A white arrow painted on one wall points west. On the floor, you can see wet footprints made by those who entered before you. It's hard to be sure, but it looks as though three of them followed the direction of the arrow, while one decided to go east. Hmm. Let's head east. Ahead, you can see a large obstruction on the tunnel floor. Although it is too dark to make out exactly what it is, the wet eastbound footprints you have been following carry on towards the obstruction. You see that the obstruction is a large brown boulder-like object. You touch it with your hand and are surprised to find that it is soft and spongy. You clamber onto the soft boulder, half expecting to be engulfed by it at any moment. Getting over it is difficult, as your limbs sink into its soft casing, but eventually you manage to struggle over it, relieved to be back on firm ground. You press on east, where the tunnel makes a turn to the left and heads north for as far as you can see. The footprints you are following start to peter out as the tunnel becomes gradually drier. Soon, you are beyond the dripping roof and the pools on the floor. You notice the air becoming hotter and you find yourself panting even though you are walking quite slowly. In a small recess on the left-hand wall, you see a section of bamboo standing on its end. Lifting it down, you see it is filled with a clear liquid. Your throat is painfully dry, and you feel a little dizzy from the heat in the tunnel. All right, here goes nothing. The water in the bamboo pipe is welcomely refreshing and adds one stamina point. It also contains a magical solution which will enable you to be exposed to melting point temperatures without harm. Discarding the bamboo, you start off north again, in good spirits. You find yourself dripping with sweat as the temperature continues to rise. As you struggle on, the heat intensifies until it becomes so unbearable that you feel yourself begin to pass out. Oh no. Although the temperature in the tunnel is higher than you could normally tolerate, the liquid from the bamboo pipe keeps you alive, and mercifully, after a few moments, the temperature drops rapidly and soon feels almost cool again. On the left-hand side of the tunnel is a closed door. It has a small iron plate in it, which looks like it might slide open. The small plate slides open easily and you find yourself peering into a room with a deep pit in the floor behind the door. 
On the opposite wall, there is a coil of rope hanging on one of two iron hooks. <laughs> what the hell? The door swings open into the room and you step back and jump over the pit. You put the rope in your backpack and jump back over the pit to leave the room and head north. All right. Ahead, you see that the tunnel turns sharply to the left. You turn a corner and almost bump straight into two fierce looking orcs armed with morning stars and wearing leather armor. You are totally unprepared for them and struggle to ready your weapons. Uh-oh. The orcs roar. And as you draw your sword, one of them swings its morning star at you, which thuds into your arm, knocking your sword to the floor. You must fight them barehanded, reducing your skill by four for the duration of the combat. Oh, wonderful. Fortunately, the tunnel is too narrow for both orcs to attack you at once. So you fight them, one at a time. You hurl yourself at your enemy, fists flailing, and land a stunning blow. No. You drop to the ground, sweeping away the orc's legs. Its head hits the ground hard with a sickening crunch. No. You duck under the orc's morning star, grab it, and ram its head hard into the wall. The first orc slumps lifeless to the floor, so you turn your attention to the other. All right. You hurl yourself at your enemy, fists flailing, and land a stunning blow. You drop to the ground, sweeping away the orc's legs. Its head hits the ground hard with a sickening crunch. No! You parry, but your enemy is too fast and you crack your head on the floor as it knocks you to the ground. Your fists are sore from the fight, but you pick up your sword and see if the orcs had anything of use. Inside one of the orc's pockets, you find one gold piece and a hollow wooden tube. You put your findings in your backpack and set off west. As you walk along, droplets of water again start falling from the tunnel ceiling. Heading west, you see wet footprints made by the same boots that you followed earlier. They lead to a closed iron door in the right-hand wall of the tunnel, but do not seem to go any further. The door opens into a large chamber, where you are shocked to see one of your rivals, who has obviously met a sudden gory death. It is one of the barbarians, and he is impaled on several long iron spikes that are fixed to a frame which has sprung out of the floor. A lot of debris litters the floor, concealing a hidden tripwire which he must have stepped on, releasing the spiked frame. In the far wall is an alcove in which you can see a silver goblet standing on a small wooden table. What should we do? All right. You walk slowly over to the alcove, carefully checking the floor for any more hidden traps. You see that the goblet contains a sparkling red liquid. Okay, last time I drank something, it worked out. So let's do it again. 
As you lift the goblet, it releases a sprung catch <gasps> and a dart shoots out of the wooden table leg. This will be a test of your luck. Well, roll two dice, and if the number rolled is equal to or less than your current luck score, you have been lucky. But if the roll is higher than your luck score, then your luck isn't in. Mm. Yay! Your reflexes are sharp, and you quickly jump aside. The dart whistles past, only just missing you, and thuds into the opposite wall. You see the goblet lying on the floor, and the red liquid running away in rivulets over the grey stone. At least the goblet may be of use. So you put it in your backpack. Can I lick it off the floor? What if it was like healing waters or something? The pouch on the barbarian's belt is empty, apart from some strange-looking dried meat wrapped in a cloth. Uh, I don't know. Could be human flesh for all I know. I don't know. Could be rancid. Let's leave it. The passage soon leads to a junction where you notice more footprints on the floor, possibly as many as three pairs heading north from the south passage. You decide to follow them to where the passage opens out into a wide cavern, which is darker but much drier. Ahead, you see the footprints gradually fade then disappear. There is a large idol in the center of the cavern that must be six meters high. In its head are jeweled eyes, each as big as your fist. On either side of the idol stand two giant stuffed bird-like creatures. I'm not going to take them. That sounds like a booby trap. Not much farther down the tunnel, you come to a closed door on your left. Putting your ear to the door, you listen intently but hear nothing. You enter a room which is small and completely empty. As soon as you are inside, the door slams shut behind you. Suddenly a voice booms out of nowhere, shouting, Welcome to Death Trap Dungeon, the ingenious killer labyrinth of my master. Adventurer, I trust you will pay your respects to my master by shouting out his name. You take a deep breath and shout, Hail Sukumvit! Once again, the mysterious voice calls out, only this time its tone is full of contempt and derision. So, we have a sniveling weed in our midst, do we? Sneers the voice. My master has a special gift for you, loathsome creep. Suddenly water starts pouring into the room through a hole in the ceiling. It soon rises above your ankles and there is no apparent way of escape. You wade back to the door. It is firmly locked, but in desperation you try ramming it with your shoulder. We'll see how skillful you really are. Remember, a roll equal to or less than your skill score means you have been skillful, but a roll higher than your skill could end badly. Oh boy. Okay. The door cannot withstand the furious battering you are giving it. The center panel cracks and splinters, enabling you to kick a hole in it large enough for you to squeeze through. Soaked, but happy to have survived your ordeal, you set off 
north again. The tunnel twists and turns, but keeps steadily north. Ahead, you see a thin shaft of blue light streaming down from the ceiling to the floor. It sparkles and shimmers, and you can see images of laughing faces in the light. You come to an arched doorway set in the right-hand wall of the tunnel. The heavy stone door is closed, but there is an iron latch and a round handle. Lifting the latch and pushing the heavy stone door open, you find yourself in a large cabin. The light is dim and murky, but as your eyes begin to adjust, you see that the walls are covered in green algae and running with moisture. The floor is strewn with straw. The atmosphere is warm, damp and fetid, and a soft humming sound fills the air. You step gingerly through the straw towards a corner of the cabin where there appears to be a shallow pit. Peering warily into the pit, you are disgusted to see a mass of pale, writhing worms, oh, yeah. some as much as half a meter long. Nauseated, you are about to turn away when you notice that their undulating bodies are swarming around a dagger. Its point held fast in a crack in the pit floor. The hilt is cased in black leather, studded with opals, and the blade is fashioned from a strange reddish-black burnished metal you have never seen before. You long to touch the dagger, but this would mean plunging your hand in among the writhing worm. Ew, I usually, I mean in real life I would never do that, but let's reach for the dagger. Taking a deep breath, you lean over the pit and plunge your forearm into the mass of wriggling worms. They are cold and clammy and feel extremely nasty, but at least they are harmless and you are able to seize the dagger by the hilt. You give it a hard tug and it comes away from the crack in which the tip was embedded. Admiring its beauty, and wondering whether it might once have belonged to some luckless contestant, you put the opal-studded dagger firmly in your belt and leave the cabin. As you make your way back to the doorway, the buzzing sound increases in intensity, and you look around desperately to discover where it's coming from. Glancing up in the nick of time, you see a huge and grotesque black shape of a giant fly emerging from a recess high up in the cavern wall. As it gets closer, you realize that it's at least one and a half meters long. Its opaque wings vibrate, making the sickening buzzing noise you can hear, and its six black hairy legs are poised to grasp your body. Below, its multifaceted eyes is a long, shiny black proboscis, which darts in and out venomously. You have stolen the giant fly's treasure from her brood of maggots, and you must face the consequences. It's time to test your luck again. Remember, a roll equal to or less than your luck score means you've been lucky but a row higher than your luck could end badly. Yay. The giant fly swoops down again to try to capture you, but this time you manage to evade its outstretched legs. Stepping back, you draw your sword to prepare to fight the hideous insect as it turns to attack you again. Wait, I thought I had luck. You hurl yourself at your enemy, fist flailing, and land a stunning blow.
The creature flies at you so close you can't use your weapons. Grabbing it by its legs, you swing around, slamming it into a wall. You spin your sword around your head, clipping the fly and removing part of one of its legs. Pleased with your victory, you wipe the vile yellow slime from the blade of your sword and walk quickly to the door, back to the tunnel, and head north. The tunnel ends shortly at a junction. Looking left and right, you see a narrow passage disappearing into the dim distance. Okay, um, I want to take a break. I don't know if it's going to just automatically save. I have absolutely no idea. Um, I mean, I sure hope so, because I can't just play the whole game for hours in one sitting, but it doesn't really tell you that it's saving, so I don't know. Hopefully it did. Um, I'm enjoying it. It got off to a bit of a slow start. Very long, 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 long intro, but I'm enjoying it now that I'm playing. Um, pretty cool game. Check it out. Death Trap Dungeon. And if you enjoyed this, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks. Bye-bye.